want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hi everyone, welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're staying home with the kids as we take a closer look at Mr. Mom, a comedy about a family man named Jack Butler, played by Michael Keaton, who loses his job and must become the homemaker while his wife, Caroline, played by Terry Garr, returns to work to become the breadwinner. This leaves Jack in charge of the chaos that is running a household with three children. Similar to how National Lampoon's vacation was based on his own family vacations as a child, Mr. Mom was based on Hugh's experiences looking after his two children in Chicago while his wife was away. Around this time, out on the West Coast, struggling producer Lauren Schuler Donner, then working at Motown Productions, read an article in National Lampoon written by John Hughes and kept in touch with him. One day, John Hughes told Donner about his disastrous experiences as a dad trying to take care of his little ones. After Donner found the story absolutely hilarious, Hughes asked if that could make a good movie, and Donner replied, it sure sounds funny to me. He said, um, I have 80 pages in a drawer of a script called Mr. Mom, do you want to read it? And I said, of course. And I read it, and it was great. Hughes flew to Los Angeles to rewrite the script with Donner. This was the second feature written by John Hughes, the first one being the critically panned National Lampoon's class reunion. As Hughes had a deal with Aaron Spelling, he brought him on as an executive producer, but Universal Studios execs were unhappy that Hughes worked out of Chicago and not LA, so they fired him I'm, I'm fired. and brought in a group of TV writers to remake his script into a television movie. Cowards. At some point, the project moved to 20th Century Fox, who thankfully decided to turn the project back into a feature film, which was a relief to Donner, as she thought Hughes' original script was far better. So with production back on track using Hughes' script, it was time to find Mr. Mom. Donner talked to her agent friend, Lori Perlman, who told her about this really funny guy named Michael Keaton. After meeting Keaton and seeing his star-making role in Ron Howard's Night Shift, Michael Keaton was cast as Jack Butler. I could not wait to get out of the theater and give Mr. Mom to Michael Keaton. I just, I mean, he was so good. Keaton actually turned down Splash to do this movie because he was worried about being typecast. Funny enough, Ron Howard was asked to direct, but he turned it down in order to make Splash. This was a big break for Keaton, as it was the first time he received top billing and carried the movie squarely on his shoulders. Other actors considered for the role were Robin Williams, John Goodman, George Siegel, Michael Douglas, Steve Martin, John Travolta, and Chevy Chase, who was busy filming Hughes' other project at the time, National Lampoon's Vacation, which you can also check out. Terry Garr was cast as Mr. Mom's wife, Caroline Butler. Garr revealed that when producers pitched the movie to her, they hid the plot reversal. Not sure why, but apparently they just told her it was about a guy who does all the work that a woman does, because it's so easy, and she wasn't completely convinced of the project until she read the script. Other actors considered for the part were Karen Allen, Jane Curtin, Farrah Fawcett, and Sally Field. Martin Mull was cast as Caroline's egotistical boss, Ron Richardson. Other actors considered for the role were Dabney Coleman, Jack Nicholson, Burt Reynolds, and Jeffrey Jones, who would work with Hughes later on in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Jeffrey Tambor plays Jinx Lathman, Keaton's sleazy boss at the automotive factory. Christopher Lloyd has a minor role as Jack's co-worker, Larry. Miriam Flynn, who we know from Hughes' other films such as National Lampoon's Class Reunion and Vacation, plays Annette. Anne Gillian plays Joan who not so secretly pines for Keaton's character. Edie McClurg, who often appears in John Hughes films like Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, has a cameo as the cashier in the grocery store. Are these Kotex maxi pads on special? Never mind, Derek. Sorry, forget it. Kotex. So with the cast in place, it was time to roll the cameras. Can I have a moment to myself, please? Hughes was actually offered the chance to direct, but turned it down due to his preference of making movies in Chicago, not Hollywood. Hughes even once said that he doesn't like being around people in the movie business. In Hollywood, you spend all of your time having lunch and making deals. Everybody is trying to shoot you down. He'd like to get the actors to Chicago, where they can make their movies in privacy. 
Stan Dragati ended up directing the film after Hughes turned it down. Like Hughes, Dragati himself was an admin turned film director, co-writing the script for his debut feature, the revisionist western Dirty Little Billy, with his creative partner, the legendary admin Charlie Moss. He helmed other films such as Love at First Bite, a spoof starring George Hamilton as Dracula, The Man with One Red Shoe, starring a young Tom Hanks, and the football comedy Necessary Roughness, all to varying degrees of success. He would later again partner with Moss to create the I Love New York tourism campaign. Unlike a typical Hughes film, this one takes place in Detroit, Michigan, which makes sense given the inciting incident of Jack being furloughed from his job at an automotive manufacturer. Similar to Hughes' other leading man that year, Chevy Chase, Keaton was also very gifted in the physical comedy department. He would just keep coming up with ideas on the spot on how to make inanimate objects funny, like the washing machine and the chainsaw. According to Jeffrey Tambor, the shot of Michael Keaton knocking him out was done in one take. Also, in the dream sequence where Caroline arrives home to find Jack kissing Joan and shoots Jack, Keaton improvised the sip from the foaming beer bottle he knocked over as he fell to the floor. And Jillian can actually be seen struggling to hide her laughter, even with her back to the camera. While this film doesn't have as many iconic cues, music cues, wow, save that five times fast, as his later films would, it does feature classic film scores from Rocky, and Chariots of Fire, which was also featured in National Lampoon's Vacation that very same year. Martin Mull was the one who came up with Yeah, 220, 221, whatever it takes. Pitching it to Keaton, who died laughing at the improvisation. He said, when I ask you how you're going to wire it, just say, you know, 220, 221, whatever it takes. <laughs> that killed me. That killed me. I just thought, this is hysterical. While Keaton says he added, whatever it takes, the idea was all Martin's. You had to do it. Once production wrapped, the film had a limited release of 126 screens on July 22, 1983, earning the number 13th spot that weekend with $947,119. When it went wide to over 1,200 screens on August 19, 1983, it opened at number 3 with $4 million, behind Easy Money and Risky Business. It didn't take long before Mr. Mom hit number 1 at the box office, though, and spent five weeks at the top. The film went on to gross just shy of $65 million in the United States, making it the ninth highest grossing film of 1983. It also made more money than the other Hughes film that year, National Lampoon's Vacation, which was released in theaters the very weekend after Mr. Mom. At the time, the reviews were not kind to this film. The reviews were horrible. They outdid themselves in, in how much they could pay on that movie. But audiences were delighted by it. There are critics who believe the film's message was sidelined since the ending sees the couple revert back to traditional gender roles instead of accepting the new dynamic and the understanding that the roles are interchangeable. Both partners in the marriage are forced to take on unfamiliar roles due to unforeseen circumstances. It doesn't matter who's at home and who's at work, as long as the family is together. And at the time of its release, Hughes was still a relative unknown, as it would be another year before he completely reinvented the teen movie, which would make him iconic. Its success led Universal to sign a three-picture deal with Hughes for $30 million, which would lead to 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Weird Science. This was one of the earliest 80s films about role reversal comedies, with others being Baby Boom, Three Men and a Baby, and Tootsie, which also featured Terry Garr. Mr. Mom hit home for a lot of viewers, as the economy was on the downturn and more and more women were entering the workforce around this time. According to Hughes, someone once deemed him a purveyor of horny sex comedies due to this movie. Hughes joked, what kind of sex? Yeah, in Mr. Mom there's a baby in the bathtub and you'd see its bare butt. Hardly the raunchy comedy that was more aligned with a film like National Lampoon's Vacation. And once Hughes took on directing duties for his own films, we would see a more sensitive, introspective side to him, with Sixteen Candles being the first of many. Remember how studio execs want Mr. Mom to be on TV initially? So a year after the film's theatrical run, in 1984, Mr. Mom was made into a 30-minute television pilot by ABC. Except for John Hughes credited for the characters and Stan Dragati credited for the story, the cast and crew were entirely different. Barry Van Dyke played Jack and Rebecca York played Caroline. 
It seems impossible to find even a frame of this pilot, but a review from the time stated that the characters and their three kids are immediately likable, but it goes downhill from there as the script lobotomizes all of its characters. And I quote, here's a textbook case in how TV takes a cute idea and a script that does have some good lines and leeches the wit out of it. That wouldn't be the only TV adaptation of Mr. Mom. In September 2019, Voodoo, the streaming service platform, released their own version of Mr. Mom, which was the platform's first original series. It serves as a continuation of the film, following an adult Megan Butler heading back into the workplace while her husband takes over the parental duties of their two children. It stars Andrea Anders and Hayes MacArthur in the roles this time around. And judging by the pilot, the show seems perfectly harmless. Trust me though, no one will confuse it for a Hughes film as it lacks the charm that he and the original cast brought to the film. I pooped. It also doesn't help that the premise is much staler in 2019 as opposed to 1983. It probably would have been more interesting to have the working wife lose her job and return home to take care of the children. Eh, maybe, maybe not. You want something to drink, like a bourbon or a scotch or something like that? Got a beer? Seven o'clock in the morning. Scotch? It is amusing to look back now and think of the pitch for this movie. So get this, the one who stays at home and takes care of the kids is... The dad? Pretty crazy, right? Hell, even the tagline cracks me up. When mom goes to work, dad goes berserk. Jesus Christ. For its time though, this film was ahead of the curve. In 1983, more women stayed at home than there were in the workforce, so it was a novelty for a man to be a stay-at-home dad. After its release, Mr. Mom became part of the vernacular and represented a segment of men who were at home dealing with the kids, and up until then, really hadn't been heard from. That's the power of film, because it spoke for, and to, a lot of men. Not only did it speak to those embracing the Mr. Mom moniker, it also helped women, due to people taking housewives for granted and not appreciating all the things they do to keep a household running. The film made women feel better about what they did because they knew that men were now understanding how difficult it is to control the chaos. This movie and the term Mr. Mom itself have been referenced time and time again in films such as Meet the Fockers. You think you can take me, Flower Man? Pretty sure I can, Mr. Mom. And TV shows like Stargate Atlantis. Look who's back! It's Mr. Mom. Fun with the kids? Hughes actually reused the gag where Jack dries the children's socks in a microwave in another movie of his. Uncle Buck. Nowadays, stay-at-home dads feel like the term Mr. Mom should be laid to rest. The National At-Home Dad Network, yes, that is a real thing, launched a campaign to terminate the phrase and simply have people refer to men who stay at home as dad. I guess I can see why they would want to erase the image of an inept dad who wouldn't know how to order from a deli. Seriously, though. Jack never stepped foot inside a grocery store before all this? Give me a quarter pound of cheese. American Blue Cream Cottage. Wait, did they just say cottage cheese? Who the hell is buying cottage cheese at the deli? And you know what? What kind of school has two different traffic routes? You're doing it wrong. That just seems sadistic and... Okay, sorry, I digress. Don't get me wrong, this film is dated in a multitude of ways. But according to Donner, that's how Hughes actually was while trying to be the primary caregiver. He had never been to a grocery store, never operated a vacuum cleaner. He just, he was literally like an idiot with these children, and it was hilarious. And for that ignorance, we thank you, Mr. Hughes. This movie has a lot of heart, and I'm particularly fond of the nods to classic films like Rocky. Which Rocky was it? One or two, or three. Uh, one, I think, I don't know. And Jaws. In the end, I give Mr. Mom four out of five woobies. And if you like what you're watching, make sure you subscribe to Joe Blow Videos. Hit that bell to receive all notifications. We're an independent company and we appreciate your support. We'll see you next time. And remember, don't feed the baby chili.